I've, you know, I've been, I've been preparing for this interview, just going through my notes before, before I called you. And, uh, uh, it made me really appreciate the scope of your work. It's like a fascinating mosaic of, I'm not even entirely sure of what, like different realities that people inhabit that you work right. with. So, uh, before we start talking about any particular, uh, reality of those, uh, let's give the listeners a little bit of a feeling of what it is that we're dealing with. So you've researched uh, people who are uh, or studied auditory hallucinations that people diagnosed with schizophrenia here and and how the content of those hallucinations differs depending on the culture they live in. You've uh, looked at evangelical Christians who experience talking to God and actually hear back from God. Uh, you, mm-hmm. I think your dissertation was on people who do like magical rituals. Is that right? Mm-hmm. That's right. And then I've heard you talk about tulpomancers, which is like people mm-hmm. who, gosh, like create, consciously create, construct entities that they then start experiencing as real and independent of them. And then sometimes, yes. some cases even more powerful than themselves, right? Yes. Um, I'm not sure they would describe them as more powerful, but they certainly seek to experience them as completely independent, Mm -hmm. as acting as if they are, you know, live in the world with nothing, you know, that, 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 that they are, that their agency has nothing to do with the person who created them. Right. So is there a way, how do you uh, formulate for yourself what it is that you study? Like what is the common core between all of these uh, experiences or ways of relating to reality, or what is the substance here that you're looking for? What are you after? So I'm, I'm inter- so I'm interested in how how things become real to people, um, mm-hmm. and I see these stories as the hard cases. Um, the story of, of psychosis is the is um, kind of a hard case of people who struggle with features of illness that in some sense are imposed upon them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I try to understand is how the choices they make about those experiences influence the experiences to some extent. So there's there's a story of psychosis in which um, I try to understand, I mean, these are real illnesses. It's hard to alter them, but I think that I'm interested in the evidence that um, you're your culture, your expectations, the way you choose, the way you choose to respond to what psychiatry would just see these meaningless symptoms will actually affect the symptoms. Mm-hmm. So that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is really the the mystery of what you could call prayer. Um, again, how people um, make choices um, in order to um, shape their experience of the world, their healthy experience of the world, so that they um, develop the sense that there are these invisible beings that interact with them. And so there's more room for observers to, to, to differ on what's going on with the experience of invisible others when people are religious. Mm-hmm. I mean, are they real beings? Or are these not? Are are these just the inventions of the mind? But um, I'm intrigued. <clears throat> just as in the story of psychosis, I'm intrigued by the the practices people use, which can enhance those experiences. I'm intrigued by what we know of whether those experiences are good for people or not. Uh, and I'm intrigued by the um, the kinds of people who are more, what we know about the individual differences between people, the kinds of people who are more likely to have these experiences than not, the way that the culture, your social world, shapes the likeliness of having those experiences. Mm -hmm. So in some broad sense, that's right, what I, how I understand myself, you know. Um, I think that these are, these edges of reality are both, um, the weirdest features of people's lives and in many ways the most fundamental. Right. Um, I mean, we don't really think much about whether tables and chairs are real. Um, there's a lot of interesting cognitive science around that, around those questions. 
But um, if somebody is able to experience God as real, it um, it's a big impact on their life. So this is one of the things that are most intriguing for myself. Um, this question of a kind of like ontological status of, of these things and, and, and uh, I guess the, the nature of what, what do we call reality? There's like, there's one Russian writer who says that reality is a one word ox oxymoron. Like it's not the word itself. We're not entirely, it's kind of self-contradictory. So in cases yes. with these, so you're not like, well, if you're researching, uh, let's say evangelicals or, uh, you know, people with, schiz people with schizophrenia, you yourself mm -hmm. don't get to talk to God, right? But you get kind mm -hmm. of a glimpse into their world. And so you, you, you mm -hmm. have a sense that this is real for them, but does it, does it influence your reality? Like what you consider real or not? Is there any sense in which like the evangelicals, let's say God is real to you because you know, it's real for so many people? So, I mean, that's a deep question. Um, and I still struggle myself with where, where I sit on that issue. I mean, there's a sense in which um, I have a sense of the realness of God. I mean, I would say that I've experienced God. Mm -hmm. um, I guess when I, when I think about how um, that theologically, I tend to have a difficulty with, you know, the guy in the sky with a white beard. Right. Um, that sense of a truly external intentional being, um, I tend to increasingly think about um, the choices we make as, as creating what we come to experience as God. And I think that the universe is complicated. I don't think that I'm certainly comfortable with the idea that there are, that humans don't grasp um, the grasp completely the nature of the universe that the world is, is you know I, I, I think it's it's a mistake to rule out the possible sense of invisible beings mm -hmm. um, but I also think that the kind of the moral challenge for humans is um, is this kind of choice making capacity that allows uh, certain ways of being in the world to become more 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 real Um that in some sense, um, what we come to call God is is created by the way in which we know and understand and respond to our world. I mean, I think, guess that's this. That would be if you. I would describe that as the broad ethical project that um, I, I think about in the in, in, as I see people engaging with their world. Mm -hmm. um, so I then become intrigued by the, uh, you know, I mean, the kinds of questions that intrigue, intrigue me intellectually are, so what happens if you imagine your mind as, um, as a place where you can, you know, you can put thoughts in and take thoughts out and you have control over your thoughts versus when you imagine your mind as a domain over which you have no control? How does that affect your, your experience? Um, what kind of um, what are the consequences of these 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 different kinds of models? Um, supposing you imagine, I mean, I think all all humans, for example, um, struggle with competing intuitions. They can, um, you know, they they have the intuition. I think all it, it is it is human to have the intuition that your thought does not affect the world, that wishing is just something people do and it has nothing to do with the world. And they also have the intuition that wishing matters. Mm -hmm. That you know, that intuition is that, you know, if you think of certain kinds of things, if you don't step on the crack, you know, on the <laughs> crack on the sidewalk, if you if you you, you 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 hold the secret and you hold it and you commit to the secret right. or whatever you're committing to, you know, if you believe it, if you build it, they will come. You know, that kind of that kind of magical thinking, they also have those powerful intuitions. And then, you know, your social world encourages the individual mm -hmm. to, uh, to m m sort of manages those different intuitions for people. And what are the, what's the consequence of that? What can we know of that? So those are the things that really intrigue me. Um, um, but then the, you know, the other... 
you know, the question of who really is God or how best to think about God. I mean, there's those more personal questions. Those also, I still struggle. Yeah. I'm still learning. I, I think that's probably the right way to, you're supposed to struggle with those questions up until the end. I, if you, if yes. you have the answer, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of the answer that you have. Um, yes. Uh, so let's say, let's take one of your studies as kind of uh, an example. And I think uh, what we see there, uh, you know, has effect on all of the other things we'll be talking about. So the, the study with hallucinatory voices. Um, so you developed, uh, the short of it, you developed a questionnaire uh, about the contents of hallucinations, like what kinds of voices people hear and how they interact with them. And you yes. asked people in America, Ghana, and India uh, these questions. So, yes. and then you found that there are actual differences depending on the culture. Yes. It's the same condition that people have, but they experience it differently. So what are some of the differences? So I thought that the two most important differences are what you would call valence or whether the voices are positive or negative mm -hmm. and, and the, the kind of the, in effect, the content of the voices. And so the more, um, the less technical way to say that is, are you hearing good things or bad things? And do you know the person who is talking? So this is a condition, psychosis, where people have auditory and quasi-auditory experience. And we, we know that for many, many people who, you know, meet criteria for schizophrenia, which is the most kind of common psychiatric disorder where people have these events, we know that a lot of people who fall into that psychiatric, which is a, it's a messy cat psychiatric category, you know, there's no... You know, I, 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 I say that, uh, you know, this category of schizophrenia is really, really useful, but there's no bright li line in the sand that separates off this category of people from other categories of other kinds of people. But in any event, so um, we know that when peop people with schizophrenia, they often have these auditory events and often there's good stuff and bad stuff so you hear people will often hear a, a voice that's sort of seductive and inspiring and and supportive and they'll often hear like a voice that screams at them or shouts commands at them or tells them that they're worthless mm -hmm. you know a voice can say things like you're disgusting you smell you should have gone under that bus rather than getting into the bus and then, the, you know, and a voice can also say, you're the one, you're the one I came for, you're the one. And then people hear murmuring and they feel hear shouting and they hear whispering and they hear loud voices and so on, all kinds of stuff. So I would sit with people and say, tell me, tell me about what, what you experience. And I, and I looked at what people said and I said, how much of this is positive? You know, and I would ask people, so are any of these, you know, it's so common that people have negative experiences. So I would ask, so are any of these voices good? And I would ask, do you know the person who's talking? Have you met them in the mm -hmm. flesh? And what I found was that compared to both Ghana and, and India, Americans were much more likely to deny positive voices. So there were more positive voices in Ghana and in, in India, and Americans were much less likely um, to know who they who was speaking. So they would say, "Well, I hear the entity, or I hear M, or I hear, you know, you know, I hear this 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 voice, and I don't name it." Um, and in, uh, in in Ghana. Um, you had more people who would say, so this is a relatively small sample in the initial study, but now I've talked to, I don't know, 60 people in America with these questions, maybe 80, and a similar number in Ghana and, and Chen, in, in Accra and Chennai, Accra and Cape Coast and Chennai. And the pattern is continuous. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in Ghana, you just have more people, maybe twice as many people as in the U.S. So like in the U.S. in this first study, three out of three people knew had actually met the person who was speaking. So they're having these, these auditory events. And the question is, 
Is it your therapist? Do you hear your therapist talking? Do you hear your parents talking? Do you hear your sister talking? Um, have you, do you know who's talking to you? And in the first study, three out of 20 of the Americans knew. And something like seven out of the 20 folks in Ghana knew. So that's a much broader number. And it was like over half, like 11, 12 of the folks in Chennai knew. Mm-hmm. In Ghana, uh, people would hear relatives, but also other people they knew. And in, in Chennai, um, people are hearing relatives. They're hearing sisters, they're hearing brothers, they're hearing parents, they're hearing fathers, they're hearing dead relatives. But it's people that are intimate and close. Um, in Ghana, both in Accra and Cape Coast, what was also quite striking was that uh, people would hear God. So more than, so over half the sample says that God is speaking to them. And, and the Americans are plenty mm-hmm. religious. Everybody I talk to in America, almost everybody I talk to in America is religious in some way. So they have a God who could, in theory, talk. But in Ghana, there is this... Um, Culture, it's you know, it, the experience that people report is that God is talking to them, and they will often say, And God tells me not to pay attention to these negative voices. Mm-hmm. They'll often reject the idea of hearing negative voices, they often have that experience. So, I'll say to people, You know, when I, would, I was um, sitting in this hospital in Accra, and uh, a number of people who meet criteria for schizophrenia, who hear hearing voices. And I'm saying, so do you find that, you know, sometimes you hear voices that say mean things to you or to or denigrate you or command you in ways you don't like, and they would reject it, they would reject it. And then I would say, well, what about, you know, sometimes when you're walking across the courtyard here, do you ever find that the other patients are whispering mean things about you? Oh, yes, that happens to me. But God tells me not to pay attention. Hmm. So what I saw in Ghana was um, what I would say, I would describe, and it came up, uh, it's pretty resilient. So I would say that something like a third of the people that I've met in, in hospitals in Accra, but also in Cape Coast, would um, emphasize the positive. They would emphasize that God is speaking. And they would describe God as having the authority to do something about this ne- the negative experiences they were having. Why do you think Americans who do believe in God did not hear God? So my hypothesis, my sense of what's going on, is that these differences are shaped by our understandings of our minds. Mm-hmm. So I think that in the U.S., even though most people are religious, we have a secular model of the mind. We think that the mind is a possession. We think our mind is fundamental to who we are. So um, this is, I mean, it's a Western thing. Um, and I suspect it's also a Russian thing. But it is, um, but it's a very striking part of a, an American culture that, um, you know, you share the content of your mind, your feelings, they are who you are. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you have to become friends with somebody, you share your feelings, you talk about your experience, you you, you become authentic when you express your anger. Um, And when that citadel of your authenticity is challenged, when you fear that your mind is broken, it's a horrifying thought. And that's not, that idea is not absent elsewhere, certainly not absent in Chennai and and Accra and Cape Coast, but it is, but I think it, um, it's so salient in America that when people start to have these odd experiences, they immediately interpret them as a sign that they're going crazy. Mm -hmm. So they do not, um, they, they are first and foremost worried about whether they're crazy and even if they hear God, they might say, well, of course, this is when I was being crazy. As this is, this is an experience. You know, that, that wasn't God. That was, you know, that was my craziness. Even though, and it's complicated because when people have these experiences, they have a quality of realness. So there's, there's something emotionally powerful about 
you know, hearing these voices, they don't feel like symptoms. They feel like something's in the world. And so an American can, can simultaneously say, I really feel this is God, but it's not real. It's a symptom. Right. It feels real, but I know it's not supposed to be real. Yeah. But I think, you know, that sort of model, I mean, I think that the, the, the South Asians, I think what I saw is that they, they have a much more salient idea that other people know what they're thinking, that they're thinking they should be paying attention to other other people mm. and this kind of sociocentric world, this this kind of world in which you are um, you know, juniors should, you know, juniors kind of your kids believe that their parents might know better than they how mm -hmm. they should be in the world. Uh, I mean we know that this is a part of South Asian culture. Um, and I think that that's why for people who hear voices in South Asia and the sense of, you know, there's not such a secular model of mind, it's just easier for people to make that first judgment that maybe you're hearing your mom call or maybe you're hearing your, your dad or your sister. And I think what happens is that as, because these experiences go on and on and on, and I think that's what's happening is that this array of messy, complicated auditory stuff that's happening, people start paying attention in habituated ways. Mm -hmm. Their culture is inviting you to pay attention in the States. I think their culture is inviting you to pay attention to, oh my God, I must be going crazy. Um, you know, and then the voice becomes harsher and meaner and more scary. Right. So you, so as long as you, you start dismissing the voice that you hear and that makes the voice kind of angrier because you're trying to, you know, expel it out of existence in some sense. Yes, I think so. That's really I interesting. I think so. And that, and, yeah. This reminds me, you were talking... And I think that that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think there's a little bit of a delay in audio. Uh, uh, so we yeah. keep a little interact, interrupting each other. Go ahead. Yeah. So, and I think that that, so I think of these as cultural invitations. These are ideas we mm -hmm. have about the world that come out of our interactions with other people. They're not cookie cutters. They don't determine the way people respond, but they shape the way that you pay attention. And in Ghana, there's such a powerful sense that God is real. God is interacting. Your mind, there's a such, there's this one of the highly salient ideas in Ghana is the idea that there are some people who um, are bad people. So people often use the word witchcraft mm -hmm. to, to describe these people. And these people, you know, they, there's, this, I, there's an idea that is widely shared that some bad people and sometimes good people, people who are men of God, um, they, you know, what they think what they, you know, their, their, their anger can be so powerful that somehow seeps into the world and affects people, can hurt people at a different, at a distance. You know, maybe you need some supernatural help. You have the people have the complicated ideas about how this happens. Or if you're a man of God, if you're a powerful person, that power is in part a mental power that you're, you know, what you think affects the world. So I think one of the things that's going on there is that people in Ghana, there's this powerful sense that you should not be thinking bad thoughts. You should not be having these negative experiences. That anger can be hurtful and scary, and other people's anger is hurtful and scary. And it's um, and again, there's this quality, when people have these auditory experiences, there's a quality of mental stuff. There's a sense that this it's both in my mind and not in my mind. And I think that in Ghana, there's such a powerful sense that the negative voices are, be you know, it's, it's just a kind of cultural reflux that people want not to have these negative experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, I, I know that I said that sort of a, a, about the U.S., but I think in, in Ghana, at least this is what I see, that people um, want a good God to be in charge of those experiences. And they want God to be, um, to kind of manage, to, to keep those experiences at bay. They don't want, uh, I mean, there are certainly some people who, you know, I met, I met folks in the hospital who thought that they were, um, 
struggling with the voices of witches. And in fact, you know, when people would talk about the experience of psychosis as a kind of spiritual attack, you would hear these voices coming at you from the outside. But there's such a clear sense that God is intimately involved with you and should have some kind of authority over those experiences. That at least what I saw is that they, um, that they were willing to make those judgments about their experiences in a way that Americans were not. Have you heard about the targeted individual community in the U.S.? The so tar- say that again? The targeted individuals community, they call themselves. So people who feel that they are being targeted by some malevolent uh, mm-hmm. entity, be it CIA or the Russians or... You haven't heard about this? Right. So oh, the, yeah, yeah. This, it, it reminded me, what you were talking about reminded me of this because... Uh, so I watched this little like uh, documentary about them, and it's a it's a fascinating kind of thing. Um, in my understanding, it, basically it's people with like paranoid tendencies. But while mm-hmm. uh, it used to be, uh, I think more commonly experienced, it was like a lonely thing. You you have mm-hmm. if if you end up with with these feelings that you're being followed by somebody, you're being watched by somebody, uh, mm-hmm. and some of these people even hear have auditory hallucinations and they hear voices that they right. think are being, they call it the voice of God technology, right? So in one case, you were talking about God and people right. hear the voice of God. Here people hear hear voices and they refer to it as a voice of God technology. That's some evil human enterprise that is trying to mimic God or something. Yeah. And so, so the interesting the, the interesting thing there is it used to be a lonely thing, as I said, like if you have the, these, these symptoms, you, you are left to struggle with them. But now with the internet, some of these people yeah. went online to look up the symptoms and found other people who have the same symptoms. And then they reinforced right. each other's suspicions that there actually is some sort of a, be it the world government, they're not entirely sure who it is, but they see that there's a whole group yeah. of people all over the country that are being targeted in this way. And so now they have like conferences right. where they, they talk about how to deal with this. And so it almost seems like, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, conspiracy theories uh, start to get, start to acquire some qualities of religions. Does that make sense? Like it's, it becomes like a, a, a consistent worldview. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely. I, I would actually love to um, get some pointers to the to the websites in which people through which people gather. I mean, I think that's very much the case for talpas that uh, or talpamancers that people that the internet has made it possible for people um, who have. The certain experiences to, to gather and then to, and in some sense, to cultivate those experiences. Um, so I haven't, I haven't myself delved into the kind of conspiracy UFO world. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it exists, and I know that it's a pretty rich world. And I think, I mean, one of the intriguing things about these experiences is I think that um, there are. You know, some people will say that psychosis is a continuum, that there are people who are very ill, who who have a lot of these experiences and end up in the hospital. And then, but it's not that they're fundamentally different from everybody else, the non-clinical population. It's more that these funny auditory experiences, they are very widely distributed and there is a, you know, and some people have just a very few of them, and some people have an awful lot of them, but they never end up in the hospital. Finding that middle group, I mean, I think there's something to this. I think that there are other kinds of bodily phenomena that, or psychological phenomena, give rise to unusual experiences. I don't think, and I think that if you're hearing God speak, you are not necessarily somebody who. You know, if, if life had treated you worse, would end up with schizophrenia. I think that there's a, I think there's a variety of pathways to these unusual experiences, but it is um, there's now a kind of active scientific uh, 
puzzle, you know, active debate about what's going on with people who have a lot of these experiences, but they don't meet clinical criteria. They have, they may hear, maybe they hear voices every day. Maybe they have a lot of sensations that other people don't have. And what are the clinical criteria? Is that like do they need to suffer from these experiences well, for this to be, be considered an illness? Yeah. Yeah. So uh-huh. if you're going to meet criteria for schizophrenia, your life has to fall apart. Uh-huh. So, you know, people who end up carrying a diagnosis typically end up being taken to the hospital by, by family or police. Something goes terribly, terribly wrong, and the person is so disconnected from what other people would call a reality that they're scooped up and taken away. Um, and, is, is there a uh, sense, so uh, let's say with, with the Health Sensory Voices study, uh, you yeah. found that it's not that it's not a problem at all in Ghana or, or India, but it's like out of the sample, fewer people experienced it as an illness, right? As a, as a source of suffering. So that is... That, so that's much less clear. So in Ghana, we mm-hmm. just don't have the data. Uh, we certainly have. So the so question you're asking is, as I, would, as, as I hear that question is, do, do these unusual symptoms, do they pose less of a problem or are they socially less awkward in Ghana and Chennai? Um, so the research that would answer that question would be epidemiological You'd you know count up the number of people in Ghana, and you'd count up the number of people who carry the diagnosis, and you'd see whether the percentage was less than in the United States. And you might have a theory about how that it was the same illness, but people identified it as you know people had other social niches. Um, we don't have those those kinds of data. I do. I did this summer spend time in Cape Coast, and I met people who, uh, so there's a spiritual practice, which is a traditionalist practice uh, in in which people um, become experts who talk to the gods. So these are folks who are called a Kung Fu or Abusung Fu in um, Where is that? It's in Ghana. Uh In Ghana. And so when I was in Cape Coast, which is a city that's two or three hours west of Accra, Mm-hmm. And so the traditional um, religion you know, in West Africa, in this part of Ghana, um, there are varieties of, the, of, the, of these practices. But these are, but the, these, this spiritual practice, or there are people who are kind of like, you know, people might call them shaman. Mm-hmm. They are people who, um, uh, they, so that they, they, they the cultural model, the way people would describe who, who becomes an kung fu. Well, there's, there, you, you are called by the gods. Right. The gods will call you in an auditory way. And you might ignore the call because it's a pain in the neck to train to be in a kung fu. And you drop out of your school and you have to, you don't have sex for two years and you have to, can't wear shoes for two years and you're wearing a sheet for two years. You know, who wants to do that? And so th- there's an idea that the person who's called by the gods is um, going to resist the call of the gods. And then the gods will drive them crazy. Right. The gods will make other people think that they're crazy. And so they might even be taken to a psychiatric hospital. But then they realize that the god is calling them. And so they go for two years of training, and it's very demanding training. I mean, you know, they are really wearing a sheet for two mm-hmm. years. And it's, you know, and, then, and when during the training, and people will say, so they teach you how to hear the gods. And they say about this training exactly what people said in the hospital. You learn how to hear the good gods. You learn who the demons are. You learn how to ignore the demons and focus on the gods. And then, you know, you're trained. And then you're the kind of person that people can go to for help. So you'll see these shrines throughout the region where I was in, you know, with signs saying, you know, a kung fu so-and-so. And, you know, you make an appointment and you make an appointment because somebody's sick. So these, these folks are often the first line in medical defense. Clinics are far, often far away. Hmm. But they're also, this is also a world in which there's a lot of ideas about malevolent forces. 
and there's you know there's there's a sense that the universe is is, is dangerous, and so you would go to an akonfu, and in in a, in a sense, you know, some people will treat them sort of as as a, have them on retainer. So, you know, if you have a business, you want to make an arrangement with a spiritual expert to kind of intervene uh-huh. and protect your business. So I interviewed a bunch of these people pretty carefully this summer, a bunch, 12. <laughs> um, but, you know, and I, I was struck by the fact that some of them um, seemed very different from the people I've spoken to who have psychosis. But, you know, something like, Half of them. Um, I mean, I also but talked to a group. So I had a total sample of about 19 people, including seven people who were Christians and who had a very active experience of God. Hmm. And of that group, I would say that roughly a third of them um, had uh, symptoms that looked like the experience of psychosis, except that they weren't ill. So they were. Um, they were. They, they went through this period of crisis, which looked to an observer, Western observer, like it might be kind of like a psychotic break. Other people thought that they were crazy. They had a lot of auditory experience. They had good voices and bad voices, and whispering voices, and voices talking to each other, and voices commanding. But they had um, none of them. Some of them were cognitively a little incoherent kind of the way mm-hmm. you might expect by somebody who also met criteria for schizophrenia and had been ill for a long time. But they were also functioning functioning effectively in their social role. And they were, um, and they would talk about having learned to manage their voice hearing experience. And they're seen as valuable by the society, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little complicated because this is, Ghana is a very Christian world, and uh-huh. these are definitely marginal people. Um, but they, you know, are like many shamans in many parts of the world, but they're also very valuable. So many Christians would be outwardly public, would publicly despise these people who consort with demons from mm-hmm. a Christian perspective. These are not Christian gods. But those same people might well consult the Akonfu if somebody fell ill in their family. So they have this kind of, I mean, I drove up, you know, you, in this part of the world, you, you know, you have a driver. So I have, I have this, you know, driver who's taking me around. And at one point, he's pull, we were pulling up to somebody's shrine and he says, oh, these people are so dirty. And, um, you know, he's clearly very kind of disdainful. But, you know, it, it's... I had the distinct sense that he would consult with them if he yeah. if he felt the need. You know what? I kind of feel that way about people who know about economy and and like the price of Bitcoin or something. I feel like this is dark magic. I don't understand the way money works, right. but right. I understand this is the reality in which I, I use money, right? Yes. And I would consult somebody whether I should you know change my rubles into dollars or euros or bitcoins to to have more. Uh, so That's the reason right. I asked about the um, the value that the society um, um, sees in these people is, you know, you talked about the ethical questions kind of from the personal point of view, like if I experience this stuff, do I have agency in this? Um, is there... Are you concerned with like the ethical uh, questions or questions of responsibility that the society or not the society, like we're all creating the culture we live in, right? We're all participating right. in culture. So in right. some sense, we're creating the context for all of the, the this whole range of experience experiences. Right. Does that mean that we are like, it, we should be trying consciously to create these cultural contexts for unusual states of consciousness or usual experiences like that? So I, th- I think it, it certainly helps. Um, mm-hmm. I think that one of the things that's happened in um, my, my social world is that people have less supernatural experience and um, and when they become psychotic, their psychosis is often 
worse. And so mm -hmm. it's if there were a um, more of a way for people to not leap immediately to the judgment that these experiences are negative, but to have some way of kind of managing them so that they um, were plausibly within a domain in which they felt productive, I think it might be better for people. It's, and it's a complicated story. Um, I, you know, religion interpreting psychotic experiences as religious has, um, is also can be very costly because these, you know, the, the God somebody meets with psychosis uh, can be a very hostile, um, you know, difficult God. And so, you know, the, the, Amer the clinicians who seek to tell people, oh, these are symptoms, um, it's not that there's no reason for that kind of orientation to the world. I mean, there, there's, um, but it is also true that um, giving people, um, I mean, we now know from research not my own that, the, that, that teaching people to interact with their voices may change the experience of the voices. So this is like people are actively encouraged to treat the voices as like coherent entities. Right. And so what happened, what I saw in Ghana and what I and so one of the things we do know about India is that, you know, when somebody falls sick at point zero, two years later, they do better in India than they do in the U S. Um, I mean that, that we do have research for on that. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of hypotheses about why that might be true, but I th also think I think that the less caustic quality, the voice hearing, may contribute to that outcome. Um, and I think that we know from uh, new radical ideas about treating psychosis that the the way that if people can be encouraged to interact with their voices, it may help to reduce the causticness of the voices within an American and European setting. Mm -hmm. What about, sorry, go ahead. Like one of the, the new uh, pieces of research that was, that was uh, published relatively recently is um, this avatar therapy. So, you know, somebody is hearing voices they're negative voices, they're, you know, they carry a diagnosis, they've been in and out of the hospital. And you sit them in front of a computer screen and you give them, you have them, I think, choose the head, the avatar that represents their most difficult voice. Mm -hmm. And you have them choose a, choose a voice timbre that represents their most difficult voice. And then their therapist you know, has them inter their therapist knows what the voice says and so makes that voice say those things. So you're disgusting, you're worthless, you're never going to amount to anything. You're just worthless, that was a stupid thing to say. So you give these sentences, that the therapist gives those sentences to the avatar and then coaches the subject on how to respond to the avatar, to mm -hmm. talk back and to engage the conversation. And so, um, you know, so there's, there's this paradoxical move in some sense that the therapist is turning the voice into a real person who you should interact with. Well, it turns out that, you know, with a therapist coaching the person to interact, that seems to improve their capacity to um, manage the voices and seems to have the voices decrease in hostility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, you, you, can, you can actually see this on YouTube, um, this avatar therapy. Um, you know, the, the, the person is encouraged to say back to the voice, no, I'm not worthless. This is what I did today. And the voice, the therapist has the voice say. Um, so it's like oh, real time. The, the therapist is playing kind of this character in yeah. real time. Uh huh. Yeah. And it's, you know, and, and, and as the therapist, the therapist is on the computer, be, not visible, but there's a kind of therapist box. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the avatar, there's the avatar, 
there's a therapist, and then there's a person who's interacting. Mm -hmm. And the therapist sometimes takes the role of the voice, and it sounds like the voice, and sometimes the therapist takes the role of the therapist mm -hmm. and says, now say to the voice, no, I'm, I, I actually do worthwhile things. You should take me more seriously. So in a recent trial, that seemed to help people. There's another approach, another new therapy called hearing voices therapy in which people sometimes, you know, so this is a little, this is grassroots. And so there are a lot of ideas about what this therapy consists in, but they will have, they will have groups. And so I heard somebody once say, there's 17 people in, in this, in my group, and three of them are human. You know, it's like, and so there's this kind of like 14 voices who are, who are, who are people. And so people are in that approach. They're encouraged to say, um, to, to respect the voice, to uh, interact with the voice, and then to negotiate with the voice. Mm -hmm. And for some people, not for everybody, but for some people, again, this seems to be helpful. Seems to help them, you know, if they have a relate. So one of the things we know is that the more caustic the voice, the worse the prognosis. So if your voice is really mean to you, you are less likely to do well 10 years later. Uh, so some of these practices, they reduce the meanness of the, of the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for the practice is very similar to what I saw in Ghana for some people in, in, in these traditionalist groups. So it sounds like the basic uh, kind of takeaway is ignoring this stuff is not a good idea. The right. more you ignore it, the more the more kind of dangerous it becomes. And then there is also so these are people who can't help but hear voices or have other uh, kinds of like supernatural or psychotic or whatever you want to call it experiences. But then there are also healthy people who choose to learn the skill, and that's that's yes. that's true for the topomancers. It's also true for these evangelical Christians that you've researched, right? When you start right. out, you might struggle with hearing God, but then you develop right. the skill. And then right. the community kind of helps you, helps, is this the right way to put it? Like imposes a kind of border on what God is. Like if you hear that, that's not God. That's not right. our God. Right. So this is, um, I think that for most people, this is a, this is a psychological experience different from psychosis. Um, but, and there, and, and people, but what people are learning to do is to identify part of their mental experience as being not themselves, but another being. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, the theological way to describe that is that people are learning to hear God speak back in their mind. Um, there, God is always speaking. How 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 can we learn to hear Him? A secular perspective would say that people are learning to identify thought events, image events, sensation events, and to identify them as not themselves, um, and to and that process of identification gets stronger over time. Mm -hmm. So. Another way, to, another description of this is that this is becomes, you know, the voice of your conscience. Secular people will have experiences of what they might identify as their conscious, their their conscience. Um, I must do this. I must give this money to so and so. I must stand up in this meeting and say this. And um, for some people, um, even in a secular world, you can by paying attention to that conscience, conscience as not being you, but a kind of a greater good mm -hmm. that can feel more and more different from you. In, in the evangelical world, I saw that people would learn to pick out um, thought events that were more spontaneous, more loud, but they were also very strongly encouraged by the community to identify only certain kinds of spontaneous, loud thought events as God. So people would say things like, well, 
um, you know, God, you've got to test it against the Bible. Uh, it's actually a lot of room for right. interpretation, you know, interpretation right. if, you're, yeah. if you're using the Bible. But, the, but the, the local group would be reading the Bible in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So the pastor once said to me, you know, if God is telling you to jump off the bridge, you're making a mistake. That's not God. Uh -huh. And there's another pastor who got up in, in church one morning and said, you know, you know, you should allow yourself to listen to God. You know, pay attention to the inner voice. Um, and you know, if you, if that inner voice is spontaneously saying to you, relax, trust yourself, you know, take that to, as God. If that inner voice says, quit your job and move to Los Angeles, um, I want you to be praying with me and praying with your house group and praying with, you know, and, and getting other people's input. And, and the idea so here's this cultural idea in this local evangelical world that God is interacting with you in your mind. And people are very sophisticated with the, with, about the humanness that kind of intervenes between you and God. So, you know, there's this God who's kind of pressing in from the outside and is talking to you in your mind. So a lot of human stuff that's leading you to, well, you know, maybe God wants me to do this, maybe God wants me to do that, you know, but maybe it's really, you know, you, Tanya, who want to do this and not God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so people will just, well, there, there are jokes about, oh, you know, she thinks that God has called her to do missionary work in Mexico and this has been Puerto Vallarta, but let me tell you, that's not God. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, so people do a lot of joking. Mm -hmm. But they also... Um, do a lot of cultivating. So they're sitting around in prayer groups saying, you know, I think God has told me this. And there's and they're they're saying, well, and they're they're reminding each other who God is. Right. So, so they're, they're shaping. talking about absolutely. And so they have this whole a lot of ideas about the, the a bad God God concept. So all of the therapy done in, in this world is about trying to work on your God concept. So you're not hearing from a God who is a, you know, mean, punitive being, but a loving being. And so you know, the therapist is trying, is kind of doing the same thing as the therapist with the avatar is doing. No, 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 you know, God, God is not telling you that you're worthless. If you're right. hearing, if you think that God is telling you that you're worthless, that's not God. That is your imposition. I think you, you, you need to think differently about God. Let's, let's go back to the Bible. Let's read John. You know, in, in John, God is not a mean, mean guy. You know, it's, and I'm caricaturing, but that's, um, but there, there is this kind of um, active cultivation of this experience, interior experience, and the the aim is to have that interior experience feel as if it has its own agency, so that when God tells you to do something. Um, you will take it as not being your judgment, but a, a, a judgment that's been made for you by this creator of the universe. And you could see that, or I could see that people got better at this over time, that people would come into the church and they would say, I don't know, God doesn't talk to me. And, you know, six to nine months later, they would say things like, I recognize God's voice the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. Hmm. So wait, does that mean they hear like that it's it's getting close to a hallucinatory experience? Well, I think for so I found that about a third of the people that I spoke to had had one or maybe a handful of experiences in which their experience of God had a distinctly auditory quality. And mm -hmm. by that I mean they, you know, they turned their head to see who was speaking. So, you know, God said, it's not the one for you. And they looked up to see who had entered the room. Mm -hmm. So I think psychologically, we see evidence that if you do what I, what I would call inner sense cultivation, you would really pay attention to your, your inner experience and you're cultivating your imagination and you're trying to you know, represent some inner world as being sensorially real, you're more likely to report those experiences. And if you're a certain kind of person, like you take your inner world seriously, like you you enjoy being caught up in your inner world, 
you're more likely to report these experiences. You know, those are those are experiences are often different in kind than psychotic experiences. They're very rare. They um, they're not they're not as physical. They're not as commanding. They you know, but you know, humans human experience is human experience, and some of them, and they have some of the same quality of you know the more people pray, the more they attempt to hear God inside their mind, um, the more they're, the, the higher the chance that they'll have at least one of these funny, truly auditory experiences. Mm-hmm. And also they'll have more of these experiences that are not fully auditory, but really feel non-agentic. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, they're lying in their bed, as somebody was telling me, um, and uh, they, maybe in this case I'm remembering, parents are getting divorced, not supposed to happen in an evangelical community. Terrible experience for this, this young person. And God spoke and said, I will always love you. And that person you know, became a, somebody very actively involved in, in church, had already been actively involved in cultivating their prayer experience. 20 years later was able to say to me, or said to me, well, that experience, that I, I, I really knew that that was God. Everything else, you know, it's hard to tell. And so people have this kind of, you know, some, some you know, and, and so people will say this as well. There's certain experiences that just grab you mm-hmm. and it just feels right. And, you know, and, and you feel that you must do this. Um, and those that the intensity of that experience, I think, is, is, is increased when you're cultivating the experience. I'm, I, I want to be mindful of your time. I know we should be wrapping yeah. up, but there's one question that I uh, want to ask uh, that's kind of not entirely really. Have you uh, looked much into Scientology and their practices? A little bit. I mean, not, um, you know, there's this Harriet Whitehead wrote a book about this that I read many years ago, but, but say more. So the reason I'm asking, uh, so they have their center practice is called auditing. And uh, right. the short of it, it works. Um, you start with uh, recounting, let's say, some early uncomfortable traumatic uh, experience. Mm-hmm. And you talk through it and you try to remember as many details as possible. And when you remembered everything and, and explained everything, what you felt, what the color of the uh, wallpaper was, all of the little details that you can remember, then you have to go back to the beginning of this experience and remember more. And you talk more and more and more. And then, uh, I actually, I've, do, I've done that because I've done a couple of interviews here on the site about Scientology. And then I actually went to a local center to uh, kind of anthropological interest, I guess you can say. Yeah. And I did this uh, right. kind of entry level auditing session. And what happens, you know, they asked me about an early uncomfortable experience so that's like kindergarten time i talked about how they you know made me eat porridge i didn't like but that memory is very short and after a certain amount of repetition i know i'm starting to make things up just to fill in the the spaces and so well that's one thing so so this this one session can end with um when you stop experiencing this memory as painful you can move on but you move on to an even earlier experience of a similar nature and so it starts with it starts kind of like psychotherapy right you talk about thing a thing that happened to you but Mm -hmm. as you go through this um what they call the bridge to total freedom uh you depart from the things you actually remember Mm-hmm. to things you kind of have to imagine to you know fill the memory and then you have to go earlier than that memory and then at some point you go as early as experiences when you were in your mother's womb and then at some point when those right. are all cleared you have to go to like past lives and then millions right. of years ago you were in a different right. planet and you start remembering those right. things so 
you were talking in, in all of these experiences that uh, you and I were talking just now, we've been talking about kind of invisible others that either mm -hmm. you can't help but experience right. or you learn, or maybe you create them like you with this Tulpomancer uh, mm -hmm. thing. I've heard somebody created uh, an entity that they experienced as real based on a cartoon character, right? So that's right. very clearly, I'm making this up, but then I, I'm going to make it right. real. But those, right. all of these are invisible others. And it seems that with, with this auditing thing, what you're doing is you're cre creating like an invisible self, right? right? You're using your imagination right. to create an identity for yourself that goes past this life and, and goes into, you know, different galaxies and, and a cosmic yes. drama around it. What do you think of that? Is that, do you think that's, I've heard you say that, and, and maybe you've mentioned uh, even in this conversation that there are, there are benefits to having, like to having a relationship with a positive invisible other. What about this like development? Cost. Yeah. What, what if, what if you do, you know, develop invisible self can, do you think this is dangerous or can this be beneficial as well? These are deep, th these are the deep questions, right? I mean, it, it's clear that, you know, what data we have, these big, big data sets about going to church, um, uh, they suggest that people live longer, on average, two to two to three years longer if they go to mm -hmm. church once a week. Um, it's more beneficial if you go to church more than once a week. Are all church? Do I think that's probably true of all churches? No. Right. Do I think that? I mean, I think psychotherapy is a lot like Scientology. You know, you go back to those memories, you recreate those memories, you understand those memories, you, you make those memories vivid. I think psychotherapy can be immensely helpful and quite costly. I mean, monetarily costly, but it can also be emotionally very mm -hmm. costly. So, um, it, you know, there was a movement in my country which was described from the outside as this satanic ritual abuse movement. So all these, these women... Were, this is back in the days of what were, what were called the memory wars. You know, women were encouraged to remember ways in which they may have been sexually assaulted. And of uh, course, mm -hmm. many women have been sexually assaulted. But um, they were encouraged to really to do with those memories, to, to uncover those memories, to experience those memories. And a good chunk of people, like tens of thousands of women, were involved with a social world with lots of therapists in which those memories were not only about uncovering their own sexual abuse, but discovering that their perpetrators were Satanists. And there were many, there's this whole industry of people who write books about this and describe their memories of having given birth to a baby inside the pentacle and then they ate the baby. Wow. They're like, you know, the, the FBI did this, you know, thousands and thousands of women. Wait, FBI did it. Where did this context come from? Like, why are people remembering satanic elements to this? Well, this is, so this was in the 80s and it went up until the early 90s. Um, it was in the context of the idea that memories could be repressed, which is true. Memories right. can be repressed. And it was in the context of the development of the multiple, uh, multiple um, identity disorder, uh, multiple personality disorder, now dissociative identity disorder. There was a book that came out, and I'm, yeah, I'm making this up, maybe 1980, 1979, called Michelle Remembers about a therapist who later married his, married his patient um, in which they uncovered the Satanists involved with her um, MPD experience. And so there were many, many, many people who had these ideas. And there are many, um, uh, you know, many books on trauma that will teach you to find, that actually had an acronym, Satanic Ritual Abuse, SRA, Wow. And thousands and many, many hundreds and hundreds of therapists were involved in identifying uh, these Satanists. And there's um, and eventually this was ended up in the law courts and and it was um, 
after a series of convictions that ruined some people's lives, it would eventually dissipated. But um, people were encouraged to have vivid mm -hmm. experiences of these Satanists. And um, it was sounded a lot like, you know, some of the Scientology, some of the description, right. you, you know, right. so if people, this is a double-edged sword. Uh, this is why it's, um, religion is so complicated. Um, this is why, you know, this is the deep existential question. How important is truth? Um, it's, you know, to some, we know. I think we know that um, if you take a secular perspective, you know, it seems false to engage, uh, have a relationship with this loving God. It probably makes your body feel better. It mm -hmm. keeps you alive mm -hmm. longer. It probably makes you a better person. Um, I actually do, I'm quite sympathetic to the idea that, um, you know, for many religious practices, um, make people more moral, empathic, caring beings. You know, there are some negative political consequences depending on what happens in your, you know, your country. Yep. There are some, um, there, you know, but there's the same structures. Um, so that's an example from a secular person pursuing the truth or pursuing this a, a lie um, is actually better for you. But there are many negative consequences. I mean, there was this group in, um, back in the beginning of my career, I, I had a, um, a brush with um, the uh, Heaven's Gate. So mm. Heaven's Gate is this community in San Diego, had a lot of elaborate ideas, people about how they were going to, you know, jump onto a starship, spaceship that was following the Hale Bob Cat comet. And um, they were part of a very tightly enclosed social world. And they developed the idea that they should, if they shuffled off their mortal coil, they would be able to get onto that spaceship and go into a, you know, enter the level above human. And so over 40 people, you know, you know, knocked back a bunch of barbiturate with a bunch of vodka, all of them died. Um, you know, it's, it's from their point of view, I mean, they were, they were following, they, they, they had a piece of the truth, which was right. that this comet would, you know, would, the spaceship would lead them beyond. To many observers, this was patently ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, this, these are complicated questions. I guess the last question then, uh, and feel free to just say no, but do you see uh, other options for it? So we're talking about creating these contexts for experiences like that. And I guess to some extent, we all experienced, like we have, you know, our own voice in our head, right? We, we, we think of relatives, what would, you know, my brother say about this or that, right? Are there um, contexts, can, can you see like a system that can be developed that is not religious and also not like medical? Or, you know, so, so we have psychotherapy and, and psychiatry mm -hmm. and, and, and this whole way of relating to this. And then we have uh, different religious or spiritual systems. Do you think there is there can be either a reconciliation of those or like a new way to, sure. of approaching this or something? Sure. I mean, I, and, and I think to some extent that's the project of being human. I mean, so I think all people, you know, manage have inner voices that, um, to, you know, help to determine their path through life, their sense of what it is to be a good person, their sense mm -hmm. of what it is to act sensibly in the world. And all people want to grab hold of those inner voices and make them effective, healthy, caring. And all of us feel that we're falling short. And so all of us, I mean, that's why religion is so compelling. That's why psychotherapy is so compelling. And so, I mean, all of us are on the quest to figure out how to do that. And if, you know, if you can figure out how to do it effect, I mean, that's what people try to do. They try to do that effectively for themselves. Right. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. This is I could ask you questions for three more hours if I could. Um, thank you. This very good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If if you're ever up to it, I would be very happy to do this again sometime in the future. Okay. No, I'd love that. That'd be good. That was a good Perfect. good conversation. Thank you. thank you so much. All right. All right. I'll let you Take. go about your morning. Um,